Well, hello, it's Samuel. Today we're going to be talking about the Roman Emperor Augustus. In my opinion, he's also the best, and he's the first. So, this is uh, not going to be an exhaustive video per se. We really, really be focusing on the basics, and even at that, more so on the pre-assassination life and then post-settlements. So, hope you're ready. Of course, as you can see, Augustus ruled from or reigned from 27 BC to 14 AD, and of course, you know, something happens in between that changes the BC and AD, but I'm sure you can figure that part out yourself. Early life. So, as you can see on the right here, I've included this handy dandy family tree that I made on some random website that I found and apparently will not give credit for it because I uh, do not know what the link is, but I mean I, I basically just googled it by finding family tree makers So I'm sure if you are interested in making one yourself, then you can certainly do that yourself So early life who is this guy? Well, he's born Gaius Octavius on September 23rd 63 BC His father is Gaius Octavius and he passed away in 59 BC when of course young Gaius is only four years old. Because of this, Augustus is primarily raised by his grandmother, Julia. And as it happens, Julia is the brother of Julius Caesar. Young Gaius Octavius lived a relatively obscure life as a young man. However, he did gain attention because of his orations at the funeral of his grandmother, which took place when I believe he was about 13 years old. He wished to fight alongside his great-uncle Julius Caesar in 46 BC, however, he did get sick and arrived in North Africa after the battle was finished. However, he did leave before the certainty of the battle was finished, so we have to give him props for his bravery there actually being willing to fight. Now, this does bring up uh, a reoccurring point that happens in Augustus's life, which it seems that at pivotal moments when he should need to be healthy, he turns out to actually have become very sick. Now, whether or not we think that this means that Augustus was a coward, or he was trying to get a buyout, or whether he really was just conveniently getting sick at all these times, we don't really know. Some of his enemies certainly claimed that he was a coward, and that this supposed coincidental sickness was just simply his way of getting out of having to do anything, you know, dirty or dangerous. And we have to give them a certain amount of credit for having thought that, but we also have to recognize that the people saying this are also his enemies. So whether or not that was the case, the, the books have been written by Augustus, so he, he says he was sick. I'm fine with accepting that he was sick. I think that it's interesting to consider that, you know, as a trade-off for his massive intelligence, he also had, you know, a fairly weak immune system, which is fine, you know. It's not like ancient people didn't get sick very often, so I'm less likely to side with Augustus's enemies on this one. On the return trip, uh, Caesar and Octavius actually spent quite a bit of time together as they were going through uh, Hispania and whatever, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, when Caesar returned to Rome, he amended his will. And we can speculate on end why Caesar changed his will, because when he did change his will, he changed it so that his primary heir and beneficiary would be Gaius Octavius. So whatever they discussed or whatever they talked about certainly must have impressed Caesar quite a bit, because I don't know if he would have made that change if he had not been impressed. There were certainly many, many people that he could have listed as his heir, but he chose Octavius, which is something very interesting. And of course, one thing to note is that Octavius, you know, despite being related to Julius Caesar, was not himself a patrician. However, he would eventually go on to gain patrician status. I wonder if you can figure out why that is. So, what happened? Well, only the most important political assassination of all time. Uh, for anybody that's familiar with the Ides of March, that would be the 15th of March. Uh, well, Caesar was assassinated. They said it couldn't have been done, but actually it was done. Uh, and had Caesar not been assassinated, this is kind of one of the great what-ifs of history, he was planning and preparing only in the next couple of days to have left to embark on probably the most ambitious campaign in history, at least up to that point in history, and probably even up to our own time. I mean, you know, considering that the, technolo the technology was much more primitive, um, he would have gone through 
Parthia, well, if he had been victorious, then swung back around the Black Sea, and then come back through Germania. So basically he would have been taken over the whole world, as far as anybody was concerned. Now, it's hard to know whether or not Caesar knew about the plot to kill him, but it is certainly fun to speculate. You know, was he none the wiser to the wishes of his enemies? Maybe. Did he know that his death would immortalize him in history and pave the way for Augustus? Perhaps. I mean, he did amend his will, and he had previously expressed that a great way to die would have been to have been unexpectedly. So, interesting. You know, did he believe that he no longer had enemies in Rome? I mean, was he that naive to think that everything was hunky-dory? Well, I don't know. Nobody really knows. But it's fun to speculate. And I think that coming up with a narrative that says, well, he was doing it to attain eternal glory is certainly a very interesting way to look at Caesar. Now, the most important part of Caesar's will was that he had an heir. Julius Caesar had a son, a clear successor, Gaius Octavius. Because, like I said before, Octavius had been adopted in Caesar's will. He was legally, in the eyes of the Romans, Julius Caesar's son. Now, Octavius had gained his name, Octavius, from his father, Octavius. However, now that Julius Caesar was his father, his name was changed. He was now, and would go on to be recognized as Gaius Julius Caesar. The most important thing that Octavius inherited, you know, aside from the wealth and possessions and whatever, was the name. People were loyal to the name Gaius Julius Caesar. And it's important that we don't understate how important that name was, especially given Caesar's reputation and the great love that the masses had for him. So, I'm skipping over basically everything that happens from 44 AD to, sorry, not 44 AD, uh, 40, 44 BC to 27 BC, because that's kind of outside of the scope of the big picture, and I don't really want to go through every single battle, whatever, and all these Roman civil wars. Uh, excuse me. However, we will pick up at the very end. The Battle of Actium basically signified the end of any more Roman, intra-Roman conflict. It really boiled down to Augustus and Agrippa's forces, and we'll get to who Agrippa is, versus Mark Antony and Cleopatra. I'm sure you know who they are. And, as it turns out, the Battle of Actium was a pretty flawless and decisive victory for Augustus and Agrippa. Antony and Cleopatra would later commit suicide, and that only left one person in power. Augustus. At the age of 33, Augustus would find himself in Alexandria, because that was the capital of Egypt, and it's important that he was 33, because, as you can, well, as you might know, famously, Alexander the Great, who died at 33, was buried in Alexandria. Alexander the Great was probably the most, one of the most respected ancient figures. And so we can start to see a bit of a parallel that's happening here. Augustus, who is, by all rights and means, the master of the Western, of the known world, at 33, is now going to embark on ruling that. He is going to do what Alexander never could. And so we can see that now we're going to have a new and better Alexander, Augustus. So, what's this first settlement thing? Well... I mean, at this point, Tagestus is by far and away the wealthiest Roman in the Roman world. There's, there's no competition. The vast amount of wealth that he inherited from Julius Caesar is mind-boggling. So, what, what is this first settlement? Well, Augustus, well, he wasn't known as Augustus at this point, but Gaius Julius Caesar, Octavian, came to the Roman Senate, and they decided, well, we'll hammer out a deal because everybody loves Augustus, and Augustus wants to do a whole lot of work that we, the Senate, don't really want to do. So let's give him a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of responsibility. In fact, let's give him basically all of the provinces that have legions attached to them. So as you can see there, I've noted that at this time, Augustus would have had 20 legions under his loyalty, whereas the Senate would have had about oh, five to six. So you can really see where the power dynamic is. He was the single person with the most military power. This is where we kind of start to see the transition from 
you know, Roman Republic, you know, oh, well, he's the consul too. Oh, he's got the bigger army, so he's in charge. And at this point, he would be granted the title of Augustus by the Senate, the venerable one, the illustrious one. Now, the second settlement was basically there was a little bit of a conspiracy. Augustus was a bit concerned. Everybody was actually quite a bit concerned because, as it turns out, Augustus was basically the only person who was able to keep the reins of power in check and to make sure that Rome didn't develop into you know, more civil wars. So the Senate very generously gave him more powers. They gave him the power of a tribune and a censor. Censors are kind of like the morality keepers and, well, they take censuses. And tribunes have the power to veto in the Senate, which is quite a bit of power. It would also grant him legal immunity. So he couldn't be taken to the courts. You know, maybe that's important. You know, Caesar might have been trying to get that and ended up becoming dictator of Rome instead. So you know, depend, depends how it shakes out. Um, he was also granted proconsular authority, which which means basically that he was given the authority of somebody that had been a consul, which is quite a bit of authority. And basically, this granted the emperor constitutional stability within the quote unquote Roman Republic, because it's hard to see how it's really a republic anymore. Within the Roman Republic, nobody could touch him, basically. This period is also referred to as the Principate. Um, the Principate, basically, uh, is kind of taking the Latin term for first citizen from princeps, which is usually how Augustus liked to be preferred to, because he, he knew that if he went around calling himself the illustrious one and, you know, people start to see, oh, he's trying to be a king again. We don't like a king, but we like Augustus and we like Julius Caesar. They're not kings. We like them. So we're, he, he called himself first citizen because he knew that that's what the people liked, and he was right. And so generally this period and beyond is what we refer to as the Principate. So, you know, who's, who, are, who are some of the people behind the throne? Who are some people that Augustus had as friends? Well, I think that there's two notable people that we can account for here. We'll start on the left here with Maecenas. He was a political and personal advisor to Augustus. He was a bit older than Augustus, about uh, 10 years or so. And very importantly for an advisor, he knew Augustus before he became emperor. If you're ever in a position of power, you always want to have somebody with you advising you that knew you before you came into power because they're able to speak to you in a way that people who know you after you came in power cannot. They can speak honestly because they don't fear reprisal. If they fear a reprisal, which naturally they might, you know, they'll become yes-men. Maecenas was not a yes-man. He was a very honest guy, and he, you know, was going to give him the goods. He was also known as a good administrator and a diplomat. However, eventually he did fall out of imperial favor, and he would die, like all people die. Um, he was also friends with Virgil, who wrote uh, the Aeneid. That might become a point of interest if you ever like to read about Roman mythology, but you can do that on your own time. And on the other side, we have Agrippa, Marcus Agrippa. He was a gifted military commander, and he had known Augustus from childhood. Augustus had actually intervened to save his life because Augustus and his family or something had uh, associated themselves with the Pompeian faction. And based on uh, August Octavius's, Augustus's request, they were granted amnesty. And from then on, Agrippa would have a fierce loyalty to Augustus. He would eventually marry into the imperial family and would produce a few heirs. Um, however, he died young in 12 BC, which is a very great shame because he was certainly one of the great military commanders and Rome would have been sunk if there weren't more to come, but thankfully there were. He was also the original builder of the Pantheon. The current Pantheon that we have today in Rome is not the one built by Agrippa. That one kind of burnt down. The one we have today is built by Hadrian. but We'll cross that river when we get there. So, this is the family tree time. The family tree for the Julio-Claudians is very complicated because they don't have the same, how do we say, Western sympathies towards not marrying your cousins. Which is, you know, whatever, that's how they did it. I'm, you know, anyways, we're not going to talk about cousin marriage because that's whack. Um... So the family tree does get quite complicated. I thought about putting in a family tree, but that previous maker that I had wasn't really cooperating. It was probably too complicated. Um, so we're just going to kind of roll through it like this. Augustus was married uh, three times. 
by the way, if you want to look up a family tree, which I do recommend, you can do that. Pardon me, you can do that. You can find it online, probably on Wikipedia or something. Um, so, Augustus was married three times. However, two are noteworthy. First is Scribonia. This is the wife that he had his only biological child, Julia, with. And before, you know, he divorced Scribonia to marry Livia Drusilla. Importantly, Livia Drusilla was part of the Claudian family. So this kind of marks the beginning of the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Wink, wink. Livia Drusilla was the mother of Tiberius, a future emperor, and Drusus, who was the father of Germanicus, Livia, and Claudius. And Claudius is a future emperor. Which means that none of those children were Augustus's biological children. Augustus would have, however, two biological relatives sit on the imperial throne through his daughter, Julia. Gaius Julius Caesar, a.k.a. Caligula, who is Augustus's great-grandson, and Lucius Domitius Echenobarbus, otherwise known as Nero, Augustus's great-great-grandson. So actually, somehow these guys end up quite distant from Augustus. And I mean, the, the Julio-Claudian dynasty goes on for a long time as far as imperial dynasties are concerned. So when we see, you know, great, great, and great, great, you know, it's a long time. Augustus would also have two adopted family members sit on the imperial throne. Tiberius, who as we've seen before, is the son of Livia Drusilla, and Claudius, the son of Tiberius's brother, Drusus. Pax Romana. The Pax Romana is often something that we hear associated with this time period, so what exactly is it? Well, Pax Romana just simply means Roman peace. This is the beginning of a prolonged period of peace that begins with Augustus's reign and that would last more or less until the end of the Severan dynasty. That's kind of really when you can say that Pax Romana is toast. It represents a period of stability across the entire empire as opposed to the previous 80 years of violent civil wars of Romans killing Romans and a whole bunch of other terrible things. Now, despite occasional violence, which did happen, of course, we have the year of four emperors and the year of five emperors, relatively speaking, this was an era of peace. This was also helped by Augustus personally financing roads, public works, etc., which not only endeared him to basically everyone, but it also made for safer, quicker travel for everyone. For military or civilian, both friend or foe, which may become important later on. I don't know. Of course, good roads make it easier and quicker and safer for the army to travel around. Looks like I put that opinion in twice, but that just goes to show how important it is. So, eventually, not everybody lives forever. Augustus is no exception, and he does die. He dies in August 19th, 14 AD. He had reigned for a good old 40 years. Now, Augustus is very keen on imperial succession, and he tries for a very long time, despite not actually having any kids of his own, um, which, I mean, it's an interesting thing. Um, but he does try very hard to make sure that there is a worthy successor, because he knows if there is no peaceful transition of a worthy candidate to the imperial throne, there will be chaos. And as we see time and again, he was right. Why he included no uh, set of imperial transition powers nobody knows. Would it have been better if he did? Probably. Is there a reason why modern and, you know, medieval monarchies spent so much time making sure they had an heir? There is a reason. Now, I did say that he tried multiple times to have a worthy successor that was blood-related, which is the most important thing. He wants somebody that's related to him, not, you know, some random adopted person uh, to become emperor. Um, however, he did get thwarted basically every single time. Marcellus was, I believe, his nephew, and he dies in 23 BC. He was kind of supposed to be the first guy, uh, but he died around the same time that Augustus got sick, actually. So, you know, double the tragedy. And then, of course, we have Gaius Caesar and Lucius Caesar dying in 4 AD and 2 AD. These were two of the sons of Agrippa and Julia, which was uh, between Augustus's friend, Agrippa, and his daughter. Um, and unfortunately, they died relatively young, around just before the age of 20. So, you know, too bad. Constantly gets thwarted by fate, despite trying so hard. 
Um, and so who's kind of left? Well, Tiberius. What's up with Tiberius? Well, Tiberius was a capable military commander. He was experienced. He'd also experienced Roman politics. He was prepared and qualified. However, he just didn't want the job. Kind of. As personality-wise, he was totally different from Augustus. Tiberius was melancholic. He was moody. He was distrustful. He was not charismatic, right? All things which totally endear people to yourself. This is just kind of the lot in life that Tiberius got. Not a happy camper. In simpler words, he was just grumpy all the time. So Augustus wanted a plan. He wanted to say, look, Tiberius is competent and capable, but I don't want a, a Tiberius to be the guy who gets to sit on the throne and have his kids inherit it forever. So Tiberius, you are going to adopt Germanicus. Who's Germanicus? Germanicus is the son of Tiberius' brother, Drusus. So these two are related. However, Germanicus is, again, the complete opposite of Tiberius. He's more in the Augustan. He's charismatic, he's popular, whatever, right? So this is Augustus trying to say, look, you're not the one calling the shots here. I'm the one calling the shots. We're going to make sure that this train continues well. You're going to make sure that Germanicus is ready to take over the imperial throne and everything's going to be great. I think also uh, Germanicus was related to uh, one of uh, Augustus's, I suppose, granddaughters, right? Granddaughters. Yeah. So that's the plan. What's the legacy? Well, Augustus reigned for 40 glorious years, the longest reign of any Western emperor. And I think one of the important things about him is that he had a vision of the empire. He set the standard for the Principate period. He set the model for how future emperors should conduct themselves, and he, he paved the road where there had been no road paved before. And as we see, Rome flourished during his time. He was a political pragmatist. He did what suited himself, and the people loved him. The people loved his father. He did the work that the Senate did not want to do. So, hey, endearing them to them, right? And he brought, importantly, he brought stability back to Rome. I think that as, as far as emperors go, it's really hard to say that anybody else other than Augustus deserves the spot of the greatest emperor. I, of course, he does have some failings, but some of them are outside of his control. So I, I forgive him for that. Certainly not without his own personal flaws, but as an emperor, he was fantastic. So that's the history of Augustus. I hope you've enjoyed, and we'll see you later. Take care. Bye-bye.